We can't understand a big God with our little human mind. There's just some things that we don't understand. I remember I was in my green room backstage at a show. It was like a New Year's Eve show. And I was having these really big existential questions flowing in my brain. And I am stressed. My heart is heavy. So stoked to do another podcast with Angela Johnson. The last time we sat down together was backstage of the San Jose Improv in like 2018 on my first podcast with my good friend Sergio, who you met through the podcast. And I think you uh, know his friend Jeff Nichols. I, I want to say I think that's it, yeah. who it was. Yeah, <laughs> so that was some years ago that we did that podcast. What up, Silicon Valley? It's so good to have you here and on the Soul Seeker podcast. Welcome to the pod, Angela. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Thank you for being here. A little bit different than last time. Last time I know you're getting ready to go on stage. And also that was a, that was a fun podcast talking about your journey in terms of growing up in San Jose, becoming a star really in comedy, even your time with the Raiderettes and all that sort of stuff. In this episode on this podcast, I was thinking we could go a little bit deeper. So what I really like to talk about here is like those dark night of the souls, those tougher times in life that really shape you to the person who you've become. And I know in uh, March of this year, you wrote your book, Who Do You Think I Am? And I'd love to just uh, hear from you what's coming up as I bring this huge topic of spirituality, life's journey, meaning of life, ghost stories, any of this. Um, Let's just see where we take it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a very spiritual person. I grew up Christian in, I didn't start going to Christian church until after my parents got divorced though. So that was probably like, I was maybe 10 when I started going to Christian church, but like teenager, young adult, definitely grew up in Christian faith. And I started my deconstruction journey probably 2015, maybe, where I really just started asking some big questions that typically were reserved for it's, you know, we can't understand a big God with our little human mind. There's just some things that we don't understand. Um, Yeah, but why this? Well, that's just because it says that in the Bible. Okay. But this doesn't make sense. And like, I remember I was, um, in my green room backstage at a show. It was like a new year's Eve show. And I was having these really big existential questions flowing in my brain, like not the right time to do it. I'm doing shows, but in between shows, the early show and the late show, I'm in my green room and I am stressed. I am just my heart is heavy. And I'm asking myself all of these questions. Like I started asking myself, like, wait a minute. So only Christians go to heaven. You're telling me that like all these other countries that are not Christian countries, like let's say Japan, where only 2% of the country is Christian. So you're telling me that the rest of that country is all going to hell. And not just right now, but like for generations and generations and all of their ancestors past, they're all in hell. That doesn't make sense to me. And then I just start thinking about all these big things to the point where I'm like crying in my green room in between shows because I don't understand God. I don't understand how we got it right. Like this doesn't feel right. And that was the beginning of my deconstruction when I really started asking myself those questions, like this doesn't seem right. And so my deconstruction journey, um, I still consider myself Christian, but I, my Christian faith looks different than how it used to, and probably looks different from a lot of people in the main mainstream church, but I love Jesus. I love God. I love love. I love the universe. I love that we are these beautiful, energetic beings and I'm learning and unlearning a lot mm. right now. So that feels like where my brain wanted to start, where my heart wanted to start. 
I love it. That's perfect. Getting straight into it. And the unlearning is so profound. You know, I think uh, many of us since the pandemic of 2020 have kind of started to ask more questions. And that's, uh, that's a process of unlearning for whatever it might be. I think for each and every one of us, there was just something. Some people, it might be the news. Other people, it might be like government agendas or other people. It could just be like their relationship to their religion. There was just so many things that we've seen in recent years. So I think the whole concept of unlearning is something that uh, many of us really it'll serve us best to really consider that. And going back to your story of being in the green room, I couldn't imagine like being in tears, having this existential angst and crisis, and then having to go on stage. So what did that look like in terms of putting yourself back together and performing? You know, the show must go on. I am a professional and I know how to stuff my feelings down. Cause it's not like that's the first time I've ever been dealing with a personal matter before going on stage. There's always something like in all the 15 years that I've been doing stand up, I've gone on stage heartbroken. I've gone on stage with the flu. I've gone on stage um, with uh, just severe pain in my jaw. I've gone on stage um, concerned after getting in a fight with my husband or my friend or whatever. Like there's always something because I'm a human being but I know how to play the role and jump into what I need to do. And here goes a show. There goes the curtain, ladies and gentlemen, Angela Johnson, I come out. And um, that's just part of the game, you Mm -hmm. know? And then as soon as you're done, you're back in your room and your quiet space. And it's like, wow. Okay. But what happens when we die? (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. I I would imagine like the normal things, um, not to normalize or like minimize a heartbreak or anything like that and going on stage, but like, you know, the existential crisis to me at least is like the biggest thing. Right. So what did that look like after the show was done and you started asking these questions, like what were your next steps? My first step was to call a friend of mine who I knew had started her deconstruction process. And this is before the term deconstruction. So now in the Christian world, if you say the word deconstruction, it's almost like a curse word. It's almost like deconstruct. Oh, they're deconstructing means like, oh, they're backsliding. Oh, they don't go to church no more. Oh, they don't, whatever. Right. It's almost like it's a, a bad term deconstructing, but this is before this was trendy. And, um, I knew a friend of mine who was very big in the church and I, I had seen her slowly start stepping away and asking some big questions. And then I was right behind her asking questions. And so I remember calling her and she kind of was just like a listening ear. And we both kind of just like cried a little bit. And she was like, it's so much bigger than we've been taught. And then that we've thought this whole time. And, um, she has been kind of a leader in my life since then, somebody that I've looked up to and she is uh, a teacher as well. She teaches courses and I've learned a lot from her. I took a women's course from her during the pandemic, 2020 quarantine, and it was an online course. And I learned so many things that I was taught growing up was witchcraft or it's evil, bad, I learned so many things about energy, about my chakras, about um, the feminine and the masculine, about my inner child, uh, about my inner victim, my saboteur, like all these different archetypes. Like I learned so much that I either was told was bad or I just had never heard of because we're we, if it's not in the Bible, then it's not of the Lord. And if it's not of the Lord, then why you want that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, I feel like calling her was my step one. And then since then it was a lonely journey Mm -hmm. and felt like it's, it's now I have community, which I love, but right in the first couple of years of deconstructing was a very lonely journey. 
Um, my husband and I were not on the same page during that time. We both grew up in the Christian world. He was in the Christian music industry. I was performing at all the main churches. And then now I was asking all these big questions and, um, he was not on that page yet. And I didn't know if he ever would be on that page, but it was something that we had to work through. And, um, I started finding podcasts that I would listen to the liturgist, uh, I started reading books. There was a book called For the Bible Tells Me So, Peter Inns. And I started finding resources and community for people who had gone before me asking these big questions that were like, something doesn't seem right. And um, uh, what was the other one? I cannot think of the name there was another book that was like untethered soul perhaps no um well so i was anyways i started reading these books and listening to podcasts and finding community and finding that i wasn't alone and um the next thing you know my husband i would hear him in conversations with friends and he would be saying things that sounded a little more like an evolved deconstructed statement and less of a very rigid black and white. This is what it is. And this is what it's not. And I remember starting to hear him say things and something as simple as like, who am I to say who goes to heaven and hell? Just a simple sentence like that. Getting into is heaven and hell real came later, but in this beginning portion was like, who hearing him say, who, who am I to say who goes to heaven and hell was a big statement because we came from, I'll tell you exactly who goes to heaven and hell. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, that's kind of how it started and evolved. And then now my husband and I have our own podcast with our friend, Brandon, and, um, it's called nights at the round table where we talk about our deconstruction of, faith, relationships, friendships, ideologies, and our reconstruction of all of those. So it's like, what do we no longer subscribe to and why? And what do we subscribe to now? What are we learning? And what did I believe yesterday that I don't believe today that next week, maybe I'll believe it again. I don't know, but we just share our journey of figuring out our faith and figuring out our ideas on things and our why we believe and subscribe to certain things. And we just share that with people. We found a community of people who have been asking themselves the same questions. And that I see myself in these direct messages that I get from people where they're like, I don't, I I know something's not right. I didn't know where to turn to. And I found your podcast and I'm just sitting here crying like, listening to you guys talk. And I'm saying like, me too. I feel this way too, but I could never bring this up at my church because I'm the praise and worship leader or because I'm the blah, 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 whatever. And so we're finding that a lot of people are where we are, you know, and for me personally, I see myself going, oh yeah, I was there like five years ago. It was a really lonely, scary place because you're questioning your foundation. You're questioning what you've built your life around. And now you're, you're, you're poking at it and finding the holes. And um, it's scary. It's scary work. Self-work is scary work. So it can also be fun. It's for sure. Scary. There's no doubt about that. And it's um, it, it is lonely for many of us. I experienced the same thing as you in terms of being on a lonely path and not really having anyone um, that I could relate to that was on that path. And till I found community through, uh, do you know, Aubrey Marcus, you probably know him. He's a podcaster. He's got, uh, on it, the supplement company. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So he started a mastermind called fit for service. So I joined that for two years and th that was really the catalyst for my own growth. And I realized through that, how powerful community is. So I'm glad you brought up community, but in terms of your relationship, now I've seen so many times that 
it seems like a partner or spouse, one side might go be going through a spiritual awakening and the other partners not on the same page. And oftentimes we see them end up separating. So what advice would you have for people listening that were they might be in that sort of situation, having some struggles with their partner going and say they're going through a spiritual awakening and the partner doesn't go, it isn't feeling that same thing. Obviously you've come on the other end of that. So what advice would you have for those people? Thankfully my husband did, um, start his, um, deconstruction journey as well. And his spiritual awakening journey as well, because honestly, I don't know where we would be if he didn't. And he stayed very black and white. There is no gray. I don't know where we would be, to be honest. Um, but my advice to anybody in that situation would be to continue doing the work, continue doing the work on yourself and getting to know yourself, getting to know God, getting to know um, your purpose and keep doing the work on yourself. Because I would love for the partnerships to stay partnerships. But if you are evolving and this person is evolving in a different way, you're always going to be right where you're supposed to be. So if this ends up ending and you move on to different places, as long as you're doing the work on yourself and becoming the best version of yourself, the highest version of yourself, then you'll be good. You'll be right where you're supposed to be. Um, so just keep doing the work. And I hope and I, I pray that you and your partner evolve together and eventually get on the same page and you guys can both awaken and evolve. All right. That's amazing advice, you know, surrendering and going deeper really. And uh, one thing that comes up for me with that as well is I actually wrote a book recently too, uh, February of this year called soul life balance, a guide to igniting and integrating spiritual awakenings. And one of the sec sections is called patience with relationships. And mm -hmm. Although I haven't directly been in a romantic partnership to this degree of like um, not being in alignment in, in the past few years in my journey, I have had plenty of struggles with friends and family that didn't really um, understand what I've been processing and what I kept hearing early on was to embody, right? To embody it rather than try to change them, embody it so they will see. And it took me a, a, a while to really understand that, but I started to see small shifts where whether it's uh, like my dad, for example, kind of similar to what you said with your husband. Now I see him saying stuff all the time, like quite frequently asking about spiritual things. And it's something like when I first started down this path, he wouldn't have cared about it seemed like, or at least understood or just whatever. And it's like, okay, these are start to have compounding effects with my friends and my family. As long as, you know, I don't try to be preachy on them. Right. And I have have patience and all those sorts of things and go deeper myself. And an interesting, this is a, uh, it can be slightly spiritually bypassing and that for sure pretty woo, but quantum physics teaches us that the outer world we experience with our five senses is a reflection of the inner world. So if our inner world is in a chaotic state, then we're going to call in more of that. So to your point, if we go deeper on the inner work, then that is how we can reflect outwardly with those relationships and they can start to, you know, I don't know. That's the part where it's pretty confusing. Is there anything that comes up for you when I bring up that stat, that, that philosophy of, of quantum physics? Um, that's interesting because, um, my husband would always say something very similar. Um, he can, he could tell where he was at in life based on, uh, the status of his room or going to the gym, right? Like if my room is a mess, I'm looking around and it's just so messy and it's gotten away from me. Odds are inside is a mess as well. Mm. I have not been paying attention in here. I have not been tuning in. I have not been bringing myself into alignment. I have not been meditating. I've not been journaling. I've not been taking time out to just be still and know that I'm God. Like I've not been doing any of that kind of stuff. If I look around and my room is a mess, then that's usually a reflection of what's happening 
inside. So it's kind of like the same type of thing calling, you know, calling in the chaos and all of that. Same thing. Like if I haven't been going to the gym, I haven't been working out. I have not been staying on my health game. Then the inside probably is the same way. Totally. And it's funny you say that. Cause I just did a, another podcast earlier today and my guest said uh, something similar in terms of like, uh, what's your room looks like. I think he mentioned making your bed and things like that. And I've actually found today really, uh, has been a cleaning day of my house. And I love the synchronicities because that started even before that podcast or, you know, now that we're chatting about it here right now. So it's beautiful when we can see these synchronicities, which brings me into another topic, spirit animals. I had something really interesting happen in probably the fall of 2020 with a, with a mouse. And I could get into this whole story, but this mouse would always enter at like peak spiritual moments. Are you familiar with the Akashic records? No. So the Akashic records is known as the library for the soul. And basically okay. it resides in, I forget what dimension exactly it is, but there's spirits in the Akashic field where they, there, it, there's no physical form, right? It's not like an actual library, but you can work with a channeler that knows how to open up the Akashic records and you can learn about your different relationships, your karmic rate relationships in this life, right? Or you can learn about your past lives, your future lives, because past and future really, to me at least, are concurrent, they're parallel lives, you know, because time is something we experience here. But anyways, I was, I was, learning quote unquote to open the Akashic records. Cause you can't just like open it, but I was like working on it and going through some deep meditation. And I asked a question, I forget exactly what it was. Um, and then I saw an orange cat and it was interesting right after that, like the mouse came through and there was just, I forget everything. I might've done a podcast about it or wrote it down somewhere, but there was just like a series of events where anytime, like something highly spiritual I was doing, this mouse would show up and it would just be like and random. This the visual of a mouse or an actual physical mouse? form, physical okay. form. So the visual was the cat when I was opening up the Kashi and I said something about like, it was sabotage. You mentioned sabotage before, like, um, I asked a question about, uh, myself sabotage or something like that. So it was interesting. I got a cat and then the mouse came through like the uh, mouse, mice and cat game, you know, but anyways, I've had so many synchronicities with like uh, spirit animals and things like that. in the past few years, I'm wondering if there are any stories that come up for you where you've had an interaction with an animal that has been like a, a big synchronicity sign, spiritual peak experience or anything like that. No, but I have been having a real issue with coyotes mm. and, um, the coyote, I, I am afraid of coyotes eating my dog is what it is. And my dog is like the love of my life. Um, what kind of dog? My husband as well, but yeah. my, my son, my dog is just. He's my, my little love. Um, he is a Yorkie Maltese Shih Tzu Cocker Spaniel miniature schnauzer. Nice. He's all the good ones. Basically we got him at the shelter and he's adorable anyway. So we used to live up in the Hills and we would always get coyotes. And I was just deathly afraid of coyotes talking. And then we moved to Nashville and, um, I'm like, cool, there's no coyotes here. We're good. Then all of a sudden coyotes came to Nashville and started overrunning the place. And now we have coyotes all over the place. And then in LA, we moved out of the Hills and into more of like the Valley. So I'm like, cool, we don't got to worry about coyotes no more. And then all of a sudden there's a coyote just walking down the street in our neighborhood. And I'm like, oh my God, I cannot get away from these freaking coyotes because I, I like hate coyotes. But then the fact that I have this feeling towards them, right? Then I have all my friends tell me, oh, you're manifesting these coyotes mm -hmm. in your life. And my friend who I called in the beginning of my journey, she was like, you need to change your perspective with these coyotes and start having some gratitude and showing some gratitude with these coyotes. And, you know, they're just doing their thing. 
And so I would go through like seasons of like trying to practice like peace and gratitude for coyotes. And then there was this one weekend I went on this retreat and we were out in the middle of just nowhere and we're laying in our sleeping bags and uh, looking up at the stars. And all of a sudden you hear all these coyotes just howling, lots of them howling. Where typically when I would hear that at home, it would trigger me so hard. And I'd start cussing at these coyotes and I'd be like, oh, but all of a sudden I'm out here in like this wilderness and um, I hear the coyotes and now it's beautiful. And I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. Just the sounds that they're making, like they're communicating, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. It was so peaceful all of a sudden. It was so beautiful. And I was like, wow, okay, yeah, I can experience gratitude with the coyote in this moment. And then the second I get home and my neighbor's like, oh, we just saw a coyote again. He's in the yard. And I'm like, damn these coyotes. And I'm like back to just friction with the coyotes. So I don't have like what you were describing, but the coyote has been a theme in my life for the past couple years, few years that I've, I'm really trying to figure out how to be with a coyote because my instinct is mama bear protect my dog. Mm -hmm. And so I, I get very, as I, when I walk out of my door, heads on a swivel the whole time, when I'm walking my dog heads on a swivel the whole time, because I'm like, Oh my God, what if there's a coyote? But that's, I have a hard time with it. And I'm really trying to figure out how to, so maybe you can give me advice. What do you think? How do I come to peace with this coyote and make sure that they don't eat my dog? Yeah, I think that's a, a great story. And thank you for sharing that. One question I have for you is, have you uh, looked up the spiritual symbolism of a coyote? I haven't. Okay. So before you do, cause I just did, cause we're doing this remote and we have our computers in front of us. So uh -huh, it's really yeah. easy. Right. Um, yeah. and I'm my own Jamie, if you will, like, uh, uh, Joe Rogan's got his dude to research stuff. So I got to do it on my own, but anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. So one thing I was taught by one of my spiritual teachers is rather than like quickly going to Google, be like, Oh, it's 11, 11 or two twenty two, or I keep seeing eight Oh eight, whatever. Um, sit in reflection, right. And sit in that contemplation and see how you feel in that moment. And cause we really are our own best guides, right? We can go to the internet or ask someone else for what it means, but I actually love to Google this stuff and to check it out and see if it resonates, but I try really hard to sit in it first to like come up for uh, that answer. So I did Google it and you want to know some things that it says, yeah, I'm taking notes right now. You're taking notes. Yeah, for sure. So you say sit in reflection of why am I upset like, about coyotes or like? Yeah, well, like in that moment that you were camping, right? You were able yeah. to find the gratitude for them because yeah, yeah. you're outside in nature and you said, oh, my friend told me to find gratitude and the love in this too. So you were set up perfectly to just be a calm center and feel your heart. And you found that gratitude. Whereas when in our daily lives, when we're walking outside, like with my dog, she's like constantly barking at other dogs because she's scared and she's got anxiety and she's trying to, uh, you know, protect herself. And that manifests as her being the sweet little golden retriever who looks evil <laughs> when she's barking, but she's really sweet. Anyways, for me, I'm, I have a head on a swivel too, right? So I totally relate to that in terms of like going outside and just our daily pressures of life. It's really hard to like sit in that contemplation and reflection. So if you can sit in uh, just silence next time you hear a coyote, right? Like at night and be like, what is this coyote here to teach me, right? What is this bringing up inside of me? And what is what is the, the lesson here? And sometimes that's when we can hear that inner voice of our higher self, if you will, that, that comes in to bring the answer in. Mm, I'm writing it down. Cool. Right, right. <laughs> I'm taking well, notes. 
I'm glad that resonates. Thanks. Uh, that's awesome. So one thing I saw is a coyote can appear when you're being initiated into your next level of spiritual. And then I got to click the link and then find what I was going to say after that. But it also says, <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like in the preview. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's definitely some interesting things here, but it does seem like there's, um, yeah, I mean, if I were saying anything at all, I'd just be projecting onto you. So I'm not even going to say anything. You right, know what I mean? Yeah. And if you want to check out the Kashik records or for anyone listening, I did a, a couple of previous podcast links to the Kashik records. I'll put it in the show notes. I work with Candace, Candace Rasa. She is absolutely incredible. I'll put her in the show notes. I've worked with about like eight different Akashic records channelers and I've sent a um, majority of people I know to Candace and a lot of people come back and, you know, I see them working with her now and I she is just that. incredible. Uh, her name are Akashic Records. Akashic Records. Akashic is A K A S H I C. Akashic. So it's the Akasha field. Um, yeah, it's a really cool thing where you can learn about yourself and you could even ask the person, like, hey, why do I keep seeing coyotes? Like, what is this about? And I always say when working with a channeler or anyone at all in terms of, yeah, anything, right? But especially channelers, like, take it with a grain of salt, like, right. It's Cause so many times we hear something and it might just be human nature. And then it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, we heard this and we believe it to be true. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, I want to be respectful of your time and get you out here out of here. So I know you have other things to do before we go. I did want to touch on labels, identity and egoic self, because you mentioned that like someone reached out at some point saying like, oh, I, my title is X, Y, Z at the church. So I don't feel comfortable, like really exploring this with myself or voicing it. It seems to me that oftentimes we get so caught up in our labels, right? Like mama bear, like whatever podcaster, comedian, what author, whatever it is. How has your relationship to like labels shifted over the past few years? So I feel like, um, I've always had like the, the bumper sticker version of you, you're not, um, you are not what you do, right? Like that whole idea of it's just my job. It's just my, this or that you are not that, but I, I feel like I could still do a lot of work um, deconstructing from labels because I, I feel like labels are a very easy way to feel peace. If I can organize things and label them what they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can identify this person is the boss. This person is less than the boss or whatever it is. Like when you start placing people in titles, in positions, even if it's just in your own mind, but you have like a hierarchy of your friends and your friendships or whatever it is, you know, your place in your community, you know, your place in this and that. Um, I feel like there's still a lot of work for me to do to really fully believe that, um, I am not what I do, but then at the same time, I feel like I have a really great understanding of it. It's like that balance because I, when I am not on stage, I am not on, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be funny. I just want to go home. I don't want to go to the club and work on new material on my off days. If I'm touring on the weekend, I don't want to go to the club on a Tuesday night on a Wednesday night. And then I see some of my friends, they're at the club every single night trying new material and they, they love it. And I'm like, I want to be home. I want to watch Law and Order SBU. I want to go to my nephew's birthday dinner. Like I did, I would much rather do that. So there's part of me that has a very good understanding of I, I am not what I do, but then at the end of the day, if it were all to be taken away from me, I don't know that I am at the place where I would be at peace. Hmm. You no, know, 
that, well, that's okay because I am not what I do. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't think I uh, have done that much work when it comes to the idea of um, those titles and things like that to where um, if it were taken away, that I would be okay. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It seems to me that you have a healthy relationship to it. You know, it's not like you identify as like, I am this comedian, you know, all that type of stuff. And it, I see what you mean. It's like the next layer kind of um but uh, I have so many more questions for you because now it gets to the the questioning of like, how do you have time at, on touring and things like this and just the nature of who you are and the public spotlight and everything else. But I am so grateful for you to make the time to come on Soul Seeker podcast. And it's great to reconnect. And you're currently on tour. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm on tour right now. It's called the Who Do I Think I Am Tour. It's based off of my book, Who Do I Think I Am? Stories of Chola Wishes and Caviar Dreams. And um, I'm filming my sixth one hour special. Wow. And that's on October 1st at the Ryman in Nashville. And um, yeah, I finish out my tour my last official date is November 11th, but we're actually going to be adding a few more dates in January and then the tour is done. Um, but yeah, so I've just been on the road touring and I'm still finishing out the year touring. Nice. Are you coming to San Jose at all? I believe that that's one of the shows we're going to be adding for January. Sweet. Well, I'll keep an eye out. And uh, I actually end up moving to Santa Cruz uh, right after my spiritual awakening in 2019, you know, the law shifts and changes, but yeah, I'd love to come out and see you again. And you're doing amazing things. And how long does it typically take to get the special released after filming? You know, it all depends. It depends where it lands. It depends on a whole bunch of stuff. So, right, so 2023 to 2024, maybe. Oh, I'm guessing it'll be probably next February or March. That this oh, pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. So like less than six months. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, awesome. That's going to be coming out. Thank you so much, Angela. I appreciate you coming on the show. I will put all the links to your podcast, your book, your Instagram, your tour dates, all the good things in the show notes. So guys, please be sure to check it out. And thank you so much, Angela. Thank you.